Juan for the, um, our third week of series in Judges. We're actually going to get into the Judges themselves, a couple of them today. Um, under, we're having some technical difficulties, so there's going to be nothing on the screens in front of you, unfortunately, to help follow you along with the text um, and to maybe show us some of those things. Our apologies for that. So this would be a great, great time if you have a Bible to get it out to uh, Judges chapter 3. We're, we're going to be in Judges chapter 3 starting verse 7 today. Apologies if you don't have a Bible along with you. Um, so we'll just have to, I guess, uh, pray for me as much as you can and listen very closely um, with ears today so our eyes aren't going to help us. Um, and every now and then you can look back at that screen. No, that would probably be distracting, but that one works. Anyway, um, never forget. Never forget. There's, there's, a th- there's thousands of war memorials in our country, uh, ranging from um, extravagant places that you can visit to simple plaques, all basically conveying the same message, um, never forget. And millions of people visit them and, and look at them and, and, and go to these places to honor the memory of the men and women who gave their lives to, um, to bring us freedom, to give us freedom. And those, those memorials remind us um, of the tragedy of war and the hopes that history won't repeat itself and that future conflicts can be resolved and ended peacefully. So, never forget well, we won't forget that wars happened. We, we, we learn, the, we learn the, the, you know, the facts and the figures and the dates and the times and the places in history class. We watch documentaries to learn more about them. We won't forget that the wars happened. But in a sense, we can forget when, when we are no longer controlled or affected by what we know. Th- those, those wars can stop being real to us when... Um, what happened in the wars can stop being real to us. Um, when, when, the, when there's knowledge in our head, that doesn't affect our hearts. So we can learn all these kind of facts about when and where it was and how many people were killed, but, but kind of never grasp the harsh reality of war and the loss of life. And when we, when we don't remember those we've lost... When we don't remember the ones we've lost, then in a sense, it stops being real to us. So that's that's why we have memorials, war memorials, so that we remember. That's why we have Memorial Day, lest we forget. So our text begins in Judges chapter 3, verse 7, and it says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, they forgot the Lord, their God, and served the Baals and the Asherahs. They forgot the Lord. What does that mean? Now, the Israelites didn't forget that the Lord existed mentally. They were no longer controlled or affected by what they knew. Though they, they knew who God was and they knew what God wanted, it he was no longer real to them. And th- this is a spiritual problem for us, too, when um, what we know in our heads doesn't affect our hearts. Okay? So we can acknowledge in our heads that something is true, but it doesn't affect the way that we live. It doesn't change the way that we live. It doesn't affect our hearts. And so the truths about God, which were once very real and vibrant to the Israelites, now we're becoming unreal to them, not real to them. They forgot the Lord. And that's the same thing with us today. Even, even though we know truths about God that we learn here, they can, they can stop being real to us out there. You know what I mean? We, we, can, we learn truths here. We're in the Bible. We're encouraging each other in the Word. We're in, we're in our Bible studies and those kind of things. And, and these are truths that are real to us, but as we get out in life, as we go out there and live life, they can stop being real to us out there. So, so we know them, but we don't taste and see and feel them. Therefore, other things, other things like idols, th- things that we can see out there, start becoming more real to our hearts, and we end up serving them 
instead. And so our first point today is don't let God become less real to us than idols. Don't let God become less real to us than idols. We often talk about how, um, you know, we're sometimes maybe we feel scared to share our faith with someone, you know, scared to witness Jesus to someone. Well, why do we fear sharing God with others if we know he's actually real? Why do we, why do we live in, in worry without trusting if we know that God is real? Why do we spend so little of our, our time and, and money on God if we know that he's real? Why do we spend so little time thinking about God if we know that he's real? Why? Why, um, why do, when, when things aren't going our way, why do so many people turn to um, money and shopping and food and drink and entertainment and work instead of turning to God? Why? Why? Because these things that we can see start becoming more real to us than God. And so we forget God. We forget that God is the one who gives us identity. God is the one who gives us purpose. God is the one who, who gives us um, pleasure. God is the one who, who gives us help in the time of trouble. God is the one who gives us love and salvation. But we forget that. We forget that God is the one who gives us that stuff. And so we, we look for our identity in our job and our work. We look for our purpose in our career. We look, for, um, we look for pleasure from food and drink and sex and, edu- and entertainment. We look for help in trouble from our own resources and our financial resources. We look, for, we look for love and salvation from our spouse, from our family that they can't give us. And we forget about God. And these things, they seem more real to us, but they can't give us what God can give us. And they don't last. And so we forget that God is real. And what God gives us is so much better than all those other things can give us. So we need to know that God is real and that idols are not. So that's the big idea that we're going to see in the text today. They forgot the Lord because he came not real to them. And other things became more real to them. And then that played its way out in their lives. So we're going to go back in the text now, and finally we're going to get to the judges. We're taking two judges, Othniel and Ehud, today, and let's hear what happens with Othniel. So this judges cycle finally begins. Verse 8, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Aram, Naharam, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. So the judge's cycle that we talked about last week begins. So the first thing that happens is disobedience, all right? The Israelites forgot the Lord, and so the Lord got angry um, with them because they turned away from him. Then you have the next part, disaster. So the Lord sold them into slavery for eight years. He, he basically he let them be, become slaves to a man, the king of Aram, named Cushan Rishathaim. Now that name means Cushan, the doubly wicked one. Now, you know he's a bad guy when he has an evil-sounding name, right? Like Darth Vader or Darth Sidious or Ivan the Terrible, right? Uh, General Grievous. Uh, we did that one. Uh, what was the other one? Yeah, General Grievous. I don't know. There's all those names that are like evil, right? So you know he's a bad guy. You know he's difficult to deal with when he has a name like Kushan, the doubly wicked one. So they're under his control for eight years, basically slaves of them. Then repentance is the next part. So they cry out to the Lord to deliver them. And then you have rescue. So the Lord finally raises up the first judge, Othniel. Othniel was the, the full-hearted disciple, nephew of Caleb, one of the original Caleb and Joshua, and who became his son-in-law because he took him up on the challenge to conquer that city. And with the Lord's help, he conquered that city. That's Othniel. Othniel is the ideal judge. You know what? He's the only one in the whole book. 
who actually just is a good guy. Othniel is an ideal judge. Um, the Holy Spirit empowered him. The Holy Spirit came on him and empowered him to do what he's going to do. And he rescued the Israelites from Cushan, the doubly wicked. He rescued them. So the Lord gave them victory and then gave them peace for 40 years until Othniel died. So we see a, the perfect version of the judges' cycle. Now, they were suffering for eight years. Question, does God sometimes seem not real to you when you see people suffering? Ever been tempted to think that way when you're, when you, um, you're thinking, ah, if God were real, why would he let this be happening? Why would he let this go on if God were real? But think about it. Think about it. If, if God wouldn't have brought this suffering on his people, they would never have seen the true situation they were in. They, they would never have seen how spiritually enslaved they were. They, they never would have seen how far away from God they were. They would never have seen the, the real punishment that they were facing if God hadn't let them taste a little bit of earthly punishment. And so he let his people suffer, not to pay them back or make their life, you know, terrible, but so that he could redeem them, so that he could love them. And God still does the same for us today. So there's our second point about making God real. The suffering that God allows makes God real to us. The suffering that God allows makes God real. Suffering doesn't mean that God isn't real. Suffering means that he is real. Suffering shows that God loves us. The suffering we, we go through always shows God's love. Because suffering, when we suffer, when we go through difficulty, that causes us to cry out to him. It, it shows that, that we can't save ourselves. When, when we realize we can't save ourselves, we cry out to him. And it, it shows us how much we need him, and it makes us want him all the more. And what does he do then? He sends a leader to save us. He sends a leader to save us. So Othniel, um, the peace that Othniel brings was real, 40 years. Okay, he, Othniel brings real peace to the land. But it can't last. It can't last because Othniel doesn't last. All right, for permanent peace, we need a leader who doesn't die. And human leaders, like Othniel, die. There's only one who doesn't. Jesus. And so the 40 years of peace that Othniel brought before his death ultimately leads us to thank Jesus for the eternal peace that he brings us beyond his death. Because ultimately and finally, the whole book of Judges points us to the judge. Consider these facts about Othniel. He was born to the tribe of Judah. Othniel's name means the Lion of God. He was God's chosen deliverer for Israel, and he rescued people from the trouble their sins had gotten them into. Kind of sounds like someone we know, doesn't it? Kind of points us to someone we know. Jesus, who was born of the tribe of Judah, he was called the Lion of the tribe of Judah in the book of Revelation. He was chosen to be God's deliverer of his people. And he rescued us from the trouble that our sins got us into. And wait, there's more. The bad guy in the story, Kushan, the doubly wicked, kind of reminds us of someone, doesn't he? The one who is doubly wicked, Satan. And we have the Lion of God came to defeat the one who is doubly wicked so that we could be free from the trouble that our sins had got us into. All of the book of Judges points us to Jesus. All of the Bible points us to Jesus. So, time to go to the next judge. So, Othniel points us to Jesus. Let's look at Ehud now. So, we're in chapter 3, verse 12. Um, here we go. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes. Ah, oh, they did it again. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. This was after Othniel died. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms, that's Jericho, 
The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. So the downward spiral starts all over again, and this time, as promised, it's worse because there's more nations attacking, and, oh, praise God, we have screens. There's more nations attacking, and, and it's 18 years. So it's worse. Okay, so verse 15. Uh, verse 15. Again, the Israelites cried out. So we're seeing the cycle. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera the Benjamite, the Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Can anyone see the Lord of the Rings? Are you a fan of that? Um, if you've seen it or read the books, if, did you ever wonder why they sent little Frodo to carry the ring all the way to Mordor? Kind of bothered you? Why did they send the weak little hobbit who can't fight like a powerful warrior? They give him the hardest task in the universe to carry the ring all the way to Mordor so it can be destroyed. Why did they send that guy? Makes no sense. Now it's a great story. But why did they send him? Um, the fact that Israel sent Ehud is, is just as shocking as that. It says, now, nothing against left-handed people. We're politically correct today. But um, it calls him left-handed. What it means, what that word means is that he, his right hand, he was restricted as of his right hand. Basically, his right hand didn't work. Basically, his right hand didn't function handicapped and somehow in his right hand. And then, in those days, your right hand was the source of your power. So, basically what we're saying is this. No one was sweating Ehud. He was a gimpy-handed right hand. He was handicapped and couldn't use his right hand. No one was afraid of him. The guards were probably mocking and laughing at him as he walked in to bring the tribute to big king Eglon. Okay. Um, verse 16. Now, Ehud... Remember, left-handed, gimpy, right-handed Ehud. Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which is like about from here to here, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. Ooh, the story gets interesting now, doesn't it? We know something they don't know. Normally, a right-handed soldier would place his sword on his left thigh. But here you have Ehud with his gimpy right hand, who probably seemed so weak-looking to all the guards that they didn't bother checking his right thigh. Those guards kind of, in, in a sense, let their guard down because this Ehud seemed like no kind of a threat at all to him. Verse 17, he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. Now, you got to think, King Eglon, you got it very fat back then. That, that meant wealth. That meant a life of wealth and ease. And so he had been growing fat, so to speak, on the tribute that he was exacting from the people of Israel. And now what happens next, okay, this is going to be very graphic and detailed story, but what happens next is a little bit of a, it's, it's like a cross between Luke Skywalker, um, Jason Bourne, and Indiana Jones. Here we go. Here's what happens. Verse 18 going on. After Ehud presented the tribute, he sent uh, on their way those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, Leave us. And they all left. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, he had reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade, and his bowels discharged. He had did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed in over it. Then he had went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. After he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked, they said he must be relieving himself in the inner room of his palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. There they saw their Lord fall into the floor, dead. While they waited, Ehud got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped to Sirah. So Ehud, acting alone, delivered a message from God, and the message came very swiftly. And 
It's a very graphic story, as I said. And then what happens after that is basically with that victory, he goes and assembles some troops from Israel, and they go and they finally drive out the Moabites out of their country, and they are freed. So the Lord gives them victory, and then he gives them peace for 80 years. Now, King Eglon didn't fear God's messenger. Let him walk into his room alone. He did not fear God's messenger, and he didn't believe God was real. Well, I would say that Ehud's sword made God real to King Eglin, wouldn't you? Which brings something to mind. The Bible speaks about the Word of God as a sharp, double-edged sword. Which brings us to our next point. The Word, the Word makes God real to us. The Word makes God real to us. So here's the thing. God wouldn't be real to us if, if, we didn't, if we didn't get to know him in his word in the Bible. He wouldn't be real to us if we didn't get to know him. His word is how God reveals himself to us. His word is how he does that. And so if, if, when we aren't in his word, what happens? We've already kind of shared this. When we aren't in his word, God can start becoming not real to us. We start forgetting that he is real. So think about it. Just in your life, do you, do you, do you spend more time concerning yourself with, um, do you spend more time concerning yourself with, let's say, financial matters and, and making a living than you do with the Word of God? Do you spend more time concerning yourself with, um, with entertaining yourself or with uh, feeding yourself or taking care of yourself physically than you spend with the Word of the Lord? Then do we wonder why sometimes those things become more real to us than God because we spend more time with them than we spend with God. So let's not make the same mistake. Let's not make the same mistake that Eglin made when he looked at God's chosen deliverer. When he looked at him, he esteemed him not because he saw him as weak. Jesus is our chosen deliverer. But when people looked at him, they esteemed him not because they saw him as weak. Isaiah describes it this way about Jesus. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. So let's see Jesus, not as foolishness or weakness, but let's see Jesus as the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's what the Word does as it points us to Jesus. The Word makes God real to us. And isn't it awesome? Because Jesus is the Word. And so finally, finally, all of, as I said before, all of Judges is pointing us to Jesus. When Jesus, when the judge came, Isaiah writes again, he had nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. Like Ehud, like Ehud, he achieved his victory alone. He was helping his people, but he wasn't being helped by his people. He crushed his people's enemy through his weakness, not through his strength. He crushed his people's enemy through his weakness. The world saw him as weak, not strong. But yet Jesus delivered his people, not through some great triumph, but through a humble defeat. He was born humbly as a baby in a manger who then died on a cross. So our last point is this. Jesus makes God real to us. Jesus makes God real to us. God and his salvation are real. So let's live as though we're real. How, how do we live as though they're real? How? By remembering by remembering. In, in, in our re reading that we had in 2 Peter, it said, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. So if, if you don't have those qualities in your life, does that mean you're not trying hard enough? No, it doesn't mean you're not trying hard enough. What it means is, it means that you're forgetting. Verse 9 says, but, but whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Those things are right there. You're forgetting they're there. 
So what do we need? Verse 12 tells us, So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. So if the forgiveness and salvation of Jesus is real to you, then you're going to live that out in your character. You're going to live that out in your life. So we need to be reminded again and again of what we already know so that we remember and don't forget. We need those truths to work in our heart as well as in our head. So how can we remember? By being in the Word. The same thing I told the kids this morning, right? By being in the Word. The Word is what makes God real to us. The Word is what strengthens us. The Word is what shows us who God is. Being in the Word um, here in, in our Bible studies together, in, in your homes, we've got to be in the Word. The Lord's Supper makes God real. God gives us His reality in the Lord's Supper to strengthen our faith and remind us what He's done for us. And, and the encouragement that we get from our groups. I can't encourage you enough to be in a group because that means not just Sunday, but that means throughout the week you're getting together with people who just just by being together in the Bible and praying together a little bit, we're, we're reminded that God is real. We live in a world that's going to try to convince us of every other thing. But when we gather around His Word and have the encouragement of our brothers and sisters, that's the thing we need to remind us that God is real. How important to be in a group that kind of does that for you, to do that with your family, to do that on your own, to do that Sunday in worship. We need to be daily remembering that God is real. Um, so ending on a thought here, I, I spent years ago now, I spent my, um, I spent my vicar year, it's like your intern year in New York. So I spent a whole year, I, months and months and months away from, away from Dawn. We weren't married yet, um, but we knew we were getting married. And so I had to spend months and months away from her. And it was hard to be apart for that long. And at that time, and, and then even in the sense that being apart that long, it was hard to eat sometimes even in a sense remember in my mind what she looked like when you're gone that long. We didn't have FaceTime, so we weren't seeing each other. We went months without seeing each other back in those old days, all right? So hard to just always even remember what she looked like and easy in the sense for her to stop being real to me when they're not there, right? So what I do? Well, I had pictures of her, so I looked at those pictures every day. Uh, we, we, we talked on the phone as much as we could afford, right? It was expensive, but we talked on the phone. And that letter that she sent me, I read that thing over and over again, right? And eventually, finally, we were reunited, and it was better than ever. Friends, one day we're going to be reunited with God, and it's going to be better than ever. Better than ever, because he's real. So until then, until then, we need to look at the pictures. Jesus. We need to look at Jesus. We need to look at the pictures. Jesus makes God real to us. Until then, we need to, we need to listen to him. The word makes God real to us. And until then, we need to endure this time because the thing is, our longing for him is agonizing. Our longing for him is miserable because he is real. And if things won't be good and perfect and well until we are with him. That's why things are miserable. So we endure with his help. Finally, God makes Jesus real for us. Jesus makes God real for us. It's Jesus that makes God real for us. So God is real. Friends, let's live. Let's live as though he's real. Let's pray. God, thank you for just being present with us today in your word. Thank you for reminding us of not only your reality, but your grace and your mercy. For us, the people who constantly turns away from you and thinks we can find better things or things that are more real or things that will help us more than, than you when you only can. So just, re just remind everyone here daily and continually of your mercy, your reality, and your presence in our lives. Because when, when we keep that in mind, we live absolutely different from the times that we forget you. So help us have hearts that remember you always in Jesus' name. Amen.